stopping now? Nope. Yep. Okay. Just jump back to my slides. Um, and then I'll do some introductions before we get going. Here we go. Files. There we go. Oh. Okay, so we've got a fantastic panel lined up today to uh, discuss this. We have Rona Sharp, who is director of teaching uh, and learning at the University of Oxford. And she was actually um, a key person who helped set up this group over 10 years ago. We also have Olatundi Durawuju, who is the faculty associate dean, a dean for uh, diversity and inclusion at uh, John Moores University. We also have Sue Atiwell, from, uh, who is head of Ed Tech at uh, JISC, and she's been working in this area furiously over the past, uh, past year. And also uh, Rob Howe, who has been working alongside JISC as well um, from the University of Northampton, uh, exploring some of these technologies in his role or as the head of learning technology. So I wonder if it would be okay to follow this particular outline here and ask Rona to go first with um, about five minutes of just where um, her perspective is in terms of that. Rona, are you okay to uh, take over? And I'll just minimize this. I'm very happy to do that, Jim. Thank you very much for that introduction. So as Jim said, I've been involved in LESIG for 10 years or more, and I do feel that I'm feeling my age a little with all of this fuss about chat GPT. I wanted to present a bit of a kind of longitudinal perspective on it. And also, uh, as I usually do, to talk about the student experience. But, I, but I'll, I'll start with a longitudinal perspective, if you like. And when my... Um, when my grandfather died, I rather was very surprised to inherit his piano and the piano stool, which came uh, packed full of books. And I wanted to share this one with you, which is called Music for the Home. And it was published in 1932. And I'm just going to read you an extract from the foreword of this book, Music for the Home. And this book is, um, so it's a piano book. It's absolutely full of different piano music. And it says, statistics prove that the sale of music of every kind and description is so seriously on the wane that publishers are inclined to fight shy of bringing out new songs or piano pieces when they know there'll be scarcely any sale for them. So these books, these piano books had stopped um, selling. What has brought about this state of affairs? I feel there is but one answer, the habit of listening to music instead of performing it. This habit is to be so deeply deplored, is so damaging to the progress and development of a beautiful art, that it's up to all music lovers to do what they can to prevent it from spreading. And I thought that was just such a lovely way of thinking about the position that we're in now, that we're worried that these new technologies are going to come along and completely destroy the way things were before and we try and change them but of course they don't destroy the way things were before and we need to have a much kind of broader context and understanding than that and i was reminded of other things like eliza i don't know how many people remember eliza that little chat program before we even had the web where you it just presented back your responses to you in a kind of humanist therapist way um, and obviously we've got things that are still going like Stack Exchange for, for coding. So I think it's really important. I feel like I need to go around with these, you know, keep calm, don't panic. It's only ChatGPT. We'll, we'll get through it as my first overriding message. The second thing I wanted to say, so I want to say that historical context, and I wanted to say a little bit about how 
ChatGPT might be useful. And I hope you've spent the weekend playing with it with your children and parents and friends. I've been uh, getting everyone to do it this weekend and watching their faces as they do. And one of the things that we're, we're struck by is its use as a productivity tool. So very often when these new technologies come along, we think they're going to replace some of the work that we do, but actually they enable us to get through that first little stage faster and then move on and do more interesting things. So productivity is a, a tool. If you use it like you would a search engine, it gets you to where you would like to be a lot more quickly than having to browse through the first 10 results, which you know is what everyone does in using these tools. And productivity is particularly useful in an inclusivity context. So inclusivity, and certainly at Oxford, we talk a lot about inclusive education, is where we're trying to reduce the gap between different groups who have to spend proportionally more time on the same task. So you have students with different characteristics who need to spend more time on doing the same task because of their background, their previous experiences, their abilities, their strengths, their weaknesses. So imagine a non-native English speaker putting into chat GPT, can you help me compose a letter to my tutor asking me for this, for example. OK, so we use these productivity tools to try and level the playing field a little bit to try and equalize the experiences for students. And I think that's really important to remember. But technological change is a challenge because it happens so fast. And I think that's one of the things we've really seen with this. So although the experts in my team tell me this has been around since November, it's really only just hit very suddenly. And we've already redesigned our assessment overnight for online open book exams during our periods of remote teaching and assessment. And I am certainly sensing a weariness amongst the academic community of having to do that all over again so quickly in response to this technological change. So it's a challenge because of the pace of change. And it's a challenge because we feel that students are ahead of us. Someone mentioned Wikipedia in the chat, and I certainly remember that feeling when we discovered the extent to which students were using Google and Wikipedia and being concerned that they're ahead of us. So I just want to offer you one approach to help with these challenges, really, and I'm sure our other excellent speakers will offer others. And perhaps predictably, I'm going to say that the one approach to help with these challenges of pace and concern about where students are is to engage with students directly, to work in partnership with them on how education and specifically assessment can respond to some of these challenges of a kind of AI augmented world that we will be living in. So we can encourage our students to use ChatGPT to research their question and critique it. And I know lots of lecturers have already started doing this to say, well, here's the task. Let's put it into ChatGPT together. Let's see what it does. And then your homework is to go away and say how your answer is likely to be different than the one from ChatGPT. Those kinds of things have started quite quickly. As ever, our teachers are amazing and creative and innovative. The other thing that I've I've heard is the use of um, a critique, which isn't just about an academic critique, but also encouraging students to think about how these kind of services might be commercialized and how they might respond to that. So I've had the pleasure of talking to some students and I will finish by just saying, telling you a few things that the students have said to me, but it's, I suppose, always my approach to go out and talk to students as quickly and as often as we can about these things. Uh, and, and the first one, I'll just give you a couple of their quotes. And the first one, um, who's an uh, electronic engineering student, and he said, it's a research tool. And actually, your own knowledge, the extent of your own knowledge, influences how well you interrogate it, OK? So if you're asking stupid questions, you get stupid answers. But if you're asking good questions because you know your subject, you'll get better use out of it. And it's just a research tool like that. And that was particularly about coding. And there's lots of really interesting um, uh, things that ChatGP could do with coding, particularly because it gives you the code and then it gives you the explanation of how it's written the code. 
And another one said, uh, well, we've always wanted model answers. We always ask our tutors for model answers and so often we, we don't get them. And I'm using it, it's an economic student who said, I'm using it um, to provide that initial structure to an answer so that I can then get started with it and I can put on the detail um, and it, it gets me up that, that kind of productivity tool up to the next level to really get started on the important bit of the, of the work. And finally, Sam said, um, international relations student, um, I'm using it how to learn. I'm asking it questions as I would ask my lecturer. He did say if they ever replied to email. Um, I'm asking them, I'm using it to learn. I'm asking it as if I was talking to an expert. Uh, that's great as long as we understand some of the um, limitations of what chat GPT can do. And I'm sure some other people were talking about that. And and finally, um, the electronic student finished by saying, he said, we're not stupid. Give us some credit. We're here how to learn. We're here to learn and, uh, you know, help us use these tools appropriately is basically what he was saying. So um, I hope that's provided a bit of context and perhaps uh, explained my approach to the way of thinking about the challenging situation that we're in. I very much look forward to hearing what other people have got to say. Thanks, Rona. That's brilliant. Olatundi, do you want to follow? Oh, brilliant. Thank, thank you very much, Jean. Um, thanks, Rona. I mean, I, I found that um, very quite in, insightful. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Because uh, I'm known to have um, microphone issues. Yeah, no. Can no. everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, yes, and I, I, I agree with um, Rona, and I, I quite like the fact that you went and, and got data from students on, on how they sort of utilize it. And I think it's important um, to, to do that. What I've been doing is been I've been following, you know, um, responses of um, of academics um, um, to this chat GPT disruption because it is a disruption, but it doesn't have to be um, what we perceive as a negative disruption, uh, which many people are seeing it as. Um, and what I've sort of gathered essentially is people have sort of um, had, you know, various reactions to it. Some people have said, you see. Um, because this would enable um, students or make it easier for students to cheat. Therefore, we need to go back to exams. Um, and of course, the, that is not, I don't think it's a right response to it because you just have to look at historical data in terms of how different student groups perform when it comes to exam. And of course, um, of all these student groups, exam as an assessment type is one of the areas where students perform least in and that gap is even wider when you start to look at different student groups, for example, when you look at student groups in terms of ethnicities. Um, so th that wouldn't be um, the go to. That shouldn't be our response is what I would say to, to that. Um, some people have expressed the fact that, you know, you don't need to worry, you know, ignore chat GPT. You know, um, if students want to cheat, let them cheat. Now we've got, you know, new technologies coming up, you know, with 97% accuracy or 99% accuracy. And they can tell us um, with great, you know, degree of certainty whether a student has produced work that has been generated by AI or, or, or chat GPT. So, you know, the, so the response is, eh, we don't need to panic, we don't need to worry. But then again, of course, that that's, I don't think is, um, is an attitude we need to sort of sustain because one, that would then mean that we also want to get into this habit of, you know, because this new software that can determine, you know, whether a student has, um, uh, uh, you know, utilize content from, from, from the AI, because then they'll be charging universities, I, I, I want to presume, you know. So that's another, on top of what we already have in terms of Turnitin, then we're also you know, thinking that, you know, that will be, that will be okay for us to sort of pay for these services so that we can um, catch, you know, students that are cheating using AI. And of course, we need to be very um, um, strict about academic in integrity. And, and, and that's, that's absolutely important. But I don't think that we should, you know, um, just think that, all right, you know, we've got those cheat, um, cheating um, uh, softwares or applications, therefore we don't need to, we don't need to worry, we don't need to do anything. What I think ChatGPT has brought to the fore um, is um, issues around our um, over-reliance on written work. 
Um, and I think that's that's the cause of, of, of this panic. When you look at a, a program, for instance, on an undergraduate degree, for instance, um, again, it depends on which uh, the discipline. Um, some of them lend themselves naturally to, you know, more written work, while others really don't. But for those who don't really need a lot of written work, you still find that the composition of assessment types involving writing is you know, significantly higher than, than other types. And that's led to the uh, next reaction that I've, that I've found, which is you know, people saying like, we need to rethink how we um, assess students. Um, so you know, rather than just you know, thinking about you know, assessment relating to just writing, for example, we can say, you know, you know, create a poster, for example, you know, mix things up a bit. Um, and and those are, that has been some of the um, reactions that, that I have seen. Um, but again, I would also caveat that with, you know, again, you need to ensure balance in, in all things. So if you've got written assessment, if you've got maybe presentation, oral pre presentation, for example, or maybe you've got scenario analysis, because those are, you know, different assessment types that you could potentially use. The idea is for you to, you know, strike a, a good balance. So I think it's sort of re, uh, forcing, um, program leaders or module leaders to think about, you know, how um, um, writing heavy are the assessment and, and just trying to make adjustments in, in, in that regard. So I think that's been another response. But what I would also um, say is there's a need for calibration. Just as uh, Rona has said, you can see that students are responding in different Way. Some are using it as a, as a, um, as a, for example, maybe as a critical friend, for example, mm -hmm. or some are using that as, as a sort of research tool. So how can we help students curate content and then, based on that, see how they reflect on, you know, what mm -hmm. they've sort of curated? It could be maybe critiquing or comparing mm -hmm. their work with what an AI will um, would produce. So those are some of the things that I, I I believe that we should really be talking about. So how do we rethink? Our assessment strategy, uh, whether we're not overly reliant on just written text, um, how can we use it as a tool to help students to sort of curate content, you know, to um, to think differently, and also maybe in, in a sort of incremental way um, um, as well. And I think that's something that is worth um, um, discussing. I'd be very keen to hear what um, um, others have got to say with, with regards to that. The only thing that I'll also um, um, talk about with regards to, you know, uh, inclusivity is um, we know that many of the um, uh, data, you know, that um, ChatGPT spews out, again, is based on, you know, the training set. My question then would be, you know, how do we ensure that a training set is one maybe um, devoid of bias or you know, cautious bias? How do we clean? those data set because if we're going to be using it, you know, um, how do we achieve things like decolonization, for example, of the curriculum um, within that? How do we ensure that students are um, having access to, you know, a, a wide array of, of literature from, you know, from different cultures, from different, you know, um, places? Uh, how can we utilize that and integrate that to, you know, to develop a more ro robust learning for, for our students rather than, you know, the, the usual text, you know, that our students, uh, we recommend to our students. So those are some of the um, areas that I think as academics as well, and, and also technology providers, um, we can start to sort of have this conversation in, on how, you know, we can sort of achieve some of these, some of these things. Mm -hmm. I think I'll stop there for now, because uh, I'm mindful Thanks, of uh, taking a lot of time. Yeah, uh, and, and then we'll take questions later on. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks, Tundi. Sue, do you want to follow up? No sound from Sue. Sorry, is that better? Sorry, I yes, hadn't, so. hadn't realised I had two mute buttons. Um, so I'll start again. Um, so I co-lead the National Centre for AI and Tertiary Education alongside Michael Webb. And in the centre, our aim was to accelerate the responsible adoption of AI across the sector. Uh, thanks to ChatGPT, we no longer need to focus on awareness raising, as it's now very much topic of the day. 
But I think reflecting on that, the speed of change has been phenomenal and it continues to be, and it's hard to keep up. So sharing information and best practice is one of our focuses, but also providing practical guidance and support to try and make life easier for our members. And we're looking at a range of things at the moment, including the impact on academic practice and the student experience. I think one of the things I really wanted to cover is that it's important to understand that AI is much wider than just generative AI and certainly wider than chat GPT. And it's already been embedded effectively in many tools we use all the time. So chatbots, recommend data, Microsoft Insights, things like that. And I think even more important than that, AI is embedded in most tools to support accessibility, such as transcription tools. So Grammarly Premium uses AI, and that's used by many dyslexic, stu dyslexic students. And discussions on how to use GPT to support accessibility are already underway, but we, there's a lot of concern about the immediate rush to not use AI to provide guidance and inadvertently disadvantaging students that have accessibility needs. And I think with the generative AI tools, and it's not just ChatGPT, Google with BERT, Lambda and BARD and Facebooks have their own tools and there's many more tools being developed and in coming to the market all the time. Increasingly, ChatGPT is being embedded across Microsoft Office products. I think somebody referred to that in the chat earlier. So it's starting to come to things like PowerPoint, Word, and moving usage into the everyday. And that makes it harder to make black and white decisions, particularly around inclusion and accessibility. So from our point of view, and what we're trying to help with, it's essential to have a clear understanding of how these tools work before making decisions around implementation, to understand what you need to think about to ensure equity and adopt responsibly. It's a rapid moving complex picture, and often first thoughts ignore the complexities and ripple effects. And it's important to take the time to reflect and look at everything in a holistic way. I'll just give you a very small example of summarising tools. You know, as soon as I saw this, I thought, oh, these are great. It's going to make going to meetings and things really easy because even though I make notes, I can never find my own top notes. But on reflecting about this, particularly from the academic point of view, you know, my favourite revision method was to create my own summaries. So there's both an opportunity and a risk involved in what at first was like, that's really positive. So for me, I think very much encouraging discussions like this. I think the more people try things out, see how they work, understand how they work and use them and share that knowledge is how we're going to learn. And particularly for me, I hope that chat GPT impacts in a similar way to COVID and acts as an accelerator to reflect on practice and ensure that we as a sector can provide the best education experience we can for our students. And that's, uh, that's where I'll hand over, Jim. Thanks, Sue. Rob, do you want to follow up? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so my um, sort of starting, I think, with AI was sort of uh, in, in some of the very early sort of university size. I mean, I was following it when it was uh, sort of being proposed really in the 40s and the 50s, 1940s, 1950s. So it's nothing particularly new. And I think what we've been spotting really is just the evolution of the, the product and the integration of that into more and more of our systems now. Um, when I was in my when I was in the uh, sort of 1980s, I was sort of doing um, uh, programming little bits of AI into BASIC on a, an old Atari sort of system. And I think Rona mentioned about Eliza, and actually that was built into into some of the work that I was doing at that point, really. And then in the 90s, it was expert systems, um, and so we were sort of starting to develop. And more recently, um, over the past couple of years, I took the maturity model that actually came out of the National Centre for AI. Um, and I actually mapped all of our processes at the university against that maturity model just to see where we are. And if you haven't done that, it's a, it's a good process to go through because it gets you thinking about all the different systems that 
and uh, processes that you have across the institution, not just for students. I mean, obviously, we, we focus a lot today on, on students because of the Alessig um, sort of steer, but actually across the whole institution. And a lot of our tools already have got AI built into them or very soon coming actually uh, into that. Some of the, the role that a lot of us have, I think, is about steering our institution in a, in a sea of technology, really. And, you know, we, we've seen in the chat, I mean, Leo mentioned about Wikipedia, Manish mentioned about SA Mills. Are we actually looking at anything radically different at the moment with ChatGPT? Yes, it's, it's obviously got uh, massive um, publicity um, and that's done OpenAI, the company behind it. Um, sort of a lot of benefit in terms of obviously commercializing it and and moving to the next stage you know in a multi-billion pound company at the end of the day they are sort of textbook actually in terms of how to raise the value um you know of the product and and other products actually around it lots of other as sue mentioned lots of other products already exist um across the sector i mean some of you already will be using various other tools that have elements of AI in it. So AI actually isn't, isn't that new from that perspective. Um, what we did with the maturity model is we looked at um, the various developments from both the student side, and I think we've, we've heard a lot about that. We've looked at it from the tutor side, so looking at what tools like ChatGPT can do in terms of helping tutors and save them some time potentially. So actually, uh, it's not just students that can use it, it's the tutors themselves, um, and also at the institution level. So you can actually use Chat and various other tools to develop strategies uh, for you as well. And actually it gives you a bit of a baseline that you can then develop on. That's no different to what some of the students will actually be doing. They'll be using it as a, uh, as a basis as they have with Wikipedia and various other tools already um, and then build their assignments on there. Um, as institutions, we already have lots of tools and techniques to help us try to, to spot when students are doing that. And obviously we have uh, academic and integrity policies to actually sort of set down the guidelines. And I think we've heard from various people about the, the importance of actually just reinforcing to students to say, you know, we expect you to create original work or at least to reference when you're using other bits of work. Um, students I've spoken to, um, students around the institution, um, some students are, more honest, I think, than others in terms of when they are actually using third party sources and then quoting those. Um, and we will continue having people um, using contract writers, but they'll probably use ChatGPT instead of a contract writer in some cases. That there's probably not a huge difference there. Uh, people that are trying to deceive will probably carry on trying to deceive. That's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, a lot of people are very goal focused. There is a particular thing that they've come into the institution to do and their motivation is to achieve that at the, the easiest possible way. So um, there is, again, no real difference from that perspective. So it is for us to actually look at our types of assignments. I think Tunde mentioned about an over-reliance on written work and we need to think about moving to more authentic assessment. Uh, we need to make things or some of the assignments think about making those more personal um, so draft and outline embrace ai it's there we can't ban it it's just going to be around it's going to keep on developing we need to think about uh, people potentially using some of that and then building on the output so doing a critique on it for example um, or as tutors, we might want to think about actually providing some modeling for our students. So actually use some of the output and explain about how people can actually build on that. But I think the idea of banning it, I think, is a um, is, is a is a, is the wrong path to go down um, to recognize it, uh, to talk about how people can bring it into their work in a in a sensible way. I think is probably a much more positive discussion to actually have uh, from where things have been previously. But certainly, you know, we've spotted all of the the panic that everyone has now in terms of of where things are. Um, so lots of lots of areas for discussion. I think as as far as that goes. So I'll hand back to you, Jim. Thanks. That's a lovely whistle-stop tour of lots of different perspectives on this. Um, 
before because there's lots of questions out there so um if people want to queue up the questions and emma i'll come to you in a minute and just in case uh, you've spotted any good ones in there i wondered if uh, just to expand upon how we understand that student experience we've had those early examples of, of just talking and having a conversation with students about it. But where do you think those key conversations should, what, what, what are the most interesting things to address in there when having conversations with students or thinking about researching in this area? Anybody got any uh, particular insights on that? I mean, I can just say something very quickly, Jamie, if that's okay yeah i mean yeah so um so at lgme we, we conducted a, a study um trying to understand um students experience of the um of the assessment process and um some of the things that were coming out um of, of that was um that um if you look at um the various sources of information that students go to when they have issues with their module um the actual module leader or tutor is actually third on the list so the first on the list is fellow students, which of course uh, might not necessarily be, you know, um, the the best way to, to get information. But there, there is this problem where of access. You know, sometimes students and when students study, usually it's in the um, very you know, late hours, and there isn't any module leader to answer any, any you know, because if you send me an email uh, outside of box times, you won't get a response, you know, and um, and it's important for students to have this um, sort of access. Not, I'm not saying that they need to have access to us all the time, but I'm just saying that if there was a tool that they can potentially go to, all right, yeah, and uh, if they've got a question, you know, well. You know, it can turn out an answer well close to as as as, as reality as possible. Yeah. Again, one needs to be very careful uh, with um, and the output of um, of ChatGPT. I think that's that's a useful thing for 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 students to to sort of, sort of think about. We also know that ChatGPT can also be developed into this sort of conversational um, AI, where you know students can have a you know conversation with with them, and you know I think there is um, an opportunity for us as academics to use some of the elements of chat GPT to create maybe like chatbots, you know, where we've got some ready answers, all right? Um, and then, you know, it can sort of utilize some of the um, ready responses to answer any module specific questions that students might have. I think there's an opportunity here and I think mm. it's something that is welcome. We can't be there for students all the time, but we can create tools, you know, um, or, or, or adapt to existing tools to help solve that mm. problem. Yeah, so you might see chat GPT beating peers in terms of ass assisting on assignments very soon. <laughs> exactly. Sue, Sue uh, did you want to jump in? I did. Um, I come in probably more from the kind of business angle than the education angle, but uh, reflecting on a few comments we've had with conversations is, you know, this is big employability issue for students. You know, AI is... Uh, is out there in the world and I know that's a phrase often used um, so but preparing students and using the tools that are being used in the in the outside world I think is an important part but I think it highlights some skills that are, I think are missing at the moment so things like you know AI does give you lots of information how to assess if that's the right information that you need for your purpose is a real skill that only academia can give to students and that will help them both in their study but also post study as well you know it's it, it's a it's a crucial skill that that is embedded in some other countries in their education but isn't in ours i think so a missing thing for me yeah and really interesting as well to start talking to employers as well to find out where they are in terms of uh, the skills and um, those sorts of things. Rona? I was thinking about the value of student experience research in understanding academic integrity generally and remembering when we, you know we all started working on plagiarism and the role that student experience research had there in shifting our view from students are dishonest, you know students are fundamentally dishonest, <laughs> to talking to students about what's really going on for them and understanding why students cheat is because 
we have bunched the assessment tasks all together. We have presented them with a single opportunity for high stakes assessment rather than doing continuous assessment. We have not provided the criteria clearly and given them opportunities to engage with them. Um, we haven't explained why the task has been set and why it's relevant to your next task or to your longer term career. So I just think student experience research, you know, has the potential to really reframe this this mm -hmm. this time that we're in. And we can go back actually and look at how that happened in the plagiarism literature and the importance that it had there. Yeah. And also links through to Sue's point, which was don't rush into this, get some they get better understanding before before making big movements uh rob i don't know whether it, you wanted to jump in or whether we want to pull i'm in just going to build on i think what uh, people said about uh, different um uses really for some of the the chatbots so uh what we've mm -hmm. been spotting over time is that pastoral support actually um sometimes it's out of hours i think tunde also mentioned that as well um able to provide support when a, a tutor is not always able to do so um and we've been looking at the degree to which uh institutions can actually train some of these chatbots to become more relevant um and we were tracking some research i think there was actually some in in europe i don't know if anyone's on the on the call already who's involved in that but they were involved in looking at chatbots to support um students that had potential mental health um issues as well mm. at, uh, out of office times that heads into quite a risky territory for me um, in terms of where are the limits about where the chatbot then hands off to, to a more um, sort of qualified professional in some case. But uh, it was interesting about what the students were reflecting already um, in terms of they were starting to feel more supported uh, in some of the air. And I know that's something that affects a lot of our uh, institutions where some of our services now are, are completely overrun. So actually providing or triaging, I think some of the support um, to some of the chatbots may be sort of more feasible now than, it, than it's been previously, but obviously it needs to be done with a, a lot of caution as well. Brilliant, thanks Rob. Um, Emma, I don't know whether you want to come yeah. online and because uh, I've found it difficult to keep up with the rate of the chat. <laughs> um, I don't know whether you've been a bit more successful. I know some of our speakers today have been offering yes, uh, little I, ideas I, in there. Victoria, Victoria's asked to ask verbally, so um, I yeah. think I'm a presenter. Um, yeah. And then I've got a couple more saved that I'll read out once Victoria's said hers. Okay, brilliant, Emma. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Emma. <clears throat> thanks for letting me speak. Um, no, I just um, my uh, I don't know if it's a question more something maybe that could um, add to the conversation or, or take things in a different direction. I'm not sure. But um, I guess my concern is as a tool for productivity. Um, there's a danger of sort of being pulled into this kind of harder, faster, quicker mentality and it's almost and a lot of the things i'm finding with my own students is what i'm needed to provide them is ways to actually sometimes switch off or to slow yeah. down their process um and to when i heard sue that was very encouraging to me that sue's sort of saying yes these technologies are coming hard and fast but actually the challenge is to um to be able to retain that kind of critical uh, take on them and to to um not not easily kind of be co-opted into that end because we are all part of a system that kind of encourages uh, eternal productivity sometimes to the detriment of health and well-being and i think i think maybe that's my question is how because a lot of that is very cliched isn't it because some of the technologies do help students slow down or they you know um they they can support well-being but i guess maybe my interest in is is, is how chat gpt might form part of a balance a broader balance more balanced approach so that actually some of the issues in the sector have been around um you know not uh, the mental health stats for students and so on not just as a result of covid but you know partly as a result of covid but to think about a kind of not a pedagogy of catharsis but in some ways mm -hmm. um some way of kind of um 
you know not sort of being pulled into the latest thing but as mm. you said as you're just trying to do here establishing what is key and what what we want to take from it as part of a broader more holistic approach sorry that's a massive comment rather than <laughs> <laughs> no it's a really important point victoria now i'm glad you raised it have we got any comments from our panel i'll be happy just jump. go on sorry rona go on well, I was just going to invite Dominic, Dominic Lukesh to speak to this, who's um, the assistive technology officer in my department, who oh, okay. draws this link between digital productivity and inclusion very well. Oh, so I'll just make him a presenter. Okay. Make but him while, we're, while we're waiting, Sue, did you want to raise a point? <clears throat> Yeah, I did. In answer to Victoria, I think, really. And I think it's that, um, you know, I think ChatGPT and, and all the, the AI products and, and the wider ones, you know, they have the potential <clears throat> to help with things like staff workload and things. But I think the other thing is it, it's it's within our gift. You know, it's there is a there is a rhetoric to, you know, this is here. You must use it. You must adopt it. Why? I think, you know, I'm saying I think for now it's about understanding it and seeing where the opportunity lies rather than thinking you have to do something and you have to do it now. <laughs> you know, that's concerning a lot of people. And I, I'd, I'd rather not increase people's, you know, mental load, really. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Dominic? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm here now. Yeah, sorry, it just took a while to unmute myself and, and get the camera on. Uh, so, yeah, I think this, this, is, this is all great. I've, I've posted in, in the chat right now is, is a link to, or earlier, a link to an article by Stephen Wolfram. And he made a really important point about we're at ChatGTP isn't just this tool that's, that's out here you know, for cheating or whatever. It is actually kind of a new empirical fact that requires <laughs> almost empirical study because it is based on technologies that we never quite imagined would be possible working in ways that are utterly counterintuitive. And so we often do not know what follows, what, what will be possible. So it's, um, you know, it is writing poetry in a, in a way that nobody thought you could, you could make. So I was actually using it to translate Czech poetry into English. I was thinking, surely that would be really awful at it, but it was really good as a process, not, not giving a finished product, but all of a sudden it can enable translators to do things. And, you know, poetry is almost never translated by a single person, you're always in two people to do it. So all, all of this stuff is all of a sudden happening in there. I gave another example in, in this, you know, I was trying to compare two different translations and, and this is really cumbersome. And I saw I was able to just quickly create a quick software tool in JavaScript and HTML using chat GTP <laughs> to, to, to allow me to sort of highlight differences within the paragraphs. And students are kind of picking up on these things. So and we kind of, so, so for example, ChatGTP cannot do any, anything with numbers. You're going to do add, multiply, you know, beyond the most basic things, but it will give you, it will write you an Excel formula to do it for you. <laughs> you know, it, it will, it will actually create a little Python program to, uh, you know, to do things that, that you may find otherwise difficult and you would not be able to do for yourself. So, so in, in a way it's kind of assisting people in different ways and and almost the thing it's almost worst at is writing an essay <laughs> even though it, it, just, it, produces, it produces relatively bland essays it kind of has a very sort of formulaic structure in the way it always you know has that to try to tell us tell you what to do and then say it and they say it again and repeats the question and so on so so it isn't it isn't very satisfying often and i, I would say sometimes the contract readers will probably still do a lot better but some of these little things like uh, supporting your work you know structuring things destructuring things and as, as long as we're kind of studying all the things it can or cannot do um and sort of reminding ourselves of what things to keep an eye on i think i think that's kind of what in the future so in a way i'm seeing this almost as this new phenomenon that requires empirical study as in in the way that you know, the, the, you know that sort of a new emerging things like the emergence of cities. All of a sudden, we have to study what, how people live in cities. And the same way, this is kind of the same thing. So we're at the very beginning of of that. And and so I definitely kind of would encourage people to to look at it as an opportunity to learn something uh, new about uh, unexpected emergencies. Yeah, and that links with the idea of understanding that student experience of using it, kind of. Uh, that that connects quite nicely with they are our e experimenters mm. for us mm. um, 
that could actively help that. What about going back to Victoria's point though about overproduction, kind of? Uh, I, I, yeah, I think that's that's a very big yeah that that's very often mentioned. But in a way, I, I had a very similar experience recently. I, I wanted to find out differences between. Uh, between PowerPoint and, and Keynote as for, for recommending it to people whether they should use one or the other. And I found hundreds of articles written by content producers. They were ex entirely free of content, repetitive. <laughs> Might as well have been written by ChatGPT. We were already in that situation. I could not find a single place that would explain like a detailed feature by feature difference between those yeah. pieces of software. And so I actually tried to use ChatGTP and it it actually gave me better results that I that I kind of had to use my own knowledge to interpret. So it wasn't by any chance perfect or or detailed, but actually kind of that iteration, the process of iteration, going back and forth, checking, using it kind of as a process of generating hypothesis, <laughs> was in a yeah. way um, w was in a way more, more beneficial. So so I think that is true. That people are worried that there's going to be more content out there, but unfortunately, there already is a lot of content out there, and and a lot of the people who are actually offer hire themselves out as contract cheaters they're also being hired by companies to produce content for their websites and 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 often that content is there just to have content and it, and it isn't very good so i think <laughs> i'm not sure if, yeah. if, if in practice it's actually going to be that much of an impact because sadly we're already <laughs> living in that world brilliant thank you dominic rob you've been patiently waiting i think mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was just to to reinforce some of the things that have been said already is that a lot of this um, isn't new. And I think, as Sue said, it's a case of taking a, a measured approach to everything that's going on, make the decisions, I think, uh, with knowledge about what's actually out there, what the capabilities are, try things for yourselves um, and then build on that rather than anything um, that is more sort of knee jerk type reaction, really. Um, and I think, as we've said already, work with the students on the development um as, as everyone has i think has been saying actually um students are very concerned that uh, they want to maintain the academic integrity of their um degrees and the qualifications generally that that we are actually providing to them so actually they're very keen to to help us in this process so th that would be my my thoughts at the moment tundi you've Got your hand up, I think. Okay. Um, Emma, do you want to pick out yeah. any questions from? Yeah, I've got, <clears throat> there's quite a few that have come through. I think some of them have been answered indirectly or directly in the session. I think um, <clears throat> one of the ones that has come up, I think from Tanya, which is a valid point, I really, like three of the questions that have come up and so we can sort of combine them together because mm. I'm conscious of the time. <clears throat> yeah. So Tanya asked, do we need to test students on knowledge memorized though? For me, it's it's more about seeing how well students apply what they've learned. Uh, in jobs, you typically don't need to have memorized everything. So that was one quote from Tanya, which I think also ties into several other things other people have said about assessment. Um, there was a bit of a discussion about AI detection in Turnitin, but I think that's kind of been picked up. <clears throat> Somebody's also raised a rather interesting question at the, towards the end. As AI tools are developing so quickly, if students use them to support their learning and assessment, might those <clears throat> that work on the assessments of the tools at the last minute have an advantage over those who got going earlier <laughs> because the tools are advancing so rapidly? <clears throat> um, and there was one other question that um, I have myself is, you know, with people, more and more people um, getting students or working with students or working with AI, has anybody actually yet run all of this stuff through their institutions, DPIA or ethical approval mm. or privacy approval or whatever yeah. it's called at your institution? So that's three yeah. questions, really. But I think in a, way, a lot of ways, they all link together. Yeah. Let's go um, back to our panel and, and see if any anybody wants to explore those ideas. Anybody want to jump in? Yes, can I? Okay, yeah. I'll go after Rob. 
I was just yep. going to say we, we've started looking at it from the point of view of, of where the data is actually being processed. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. um, a lot of us, I think, forget when we use some of these tools or when our institution signs up to, to anything particularly, we don't always know where the processing is is taking place and what is happening to the, the data. So you can imagine the millions of people that have now signed up to um, open AI to get access to chat GPT. What's going to happen essentially to all of that, that information? And obviously, all of the the questions of, that people have been asking it, um, you know, to what extent can OpenAI actually do a lot with that that information, not just refining the tool. And it was interesting, I think, how um, as a company they actually were looking at what the press was doing and talking about them. So they, I think, they've avoided some of the the potholes. They did a lot of testing uh, prior to to releasing. Um, they didn't into the pothole that that Google hit uh, a couple of weeks ago um, and I think you know people saw the the problems that occur that when actually the tool is not properly uh, tested out but I think a lot more is starting to come out now about the way that uh, chat GPT actually generates its responses and the training data that actually was used and the way it was actually gathered uh, and the ethics uh, of that as well there's a lot more I think that is starting to become uh, people, people are becoming aware of now uh, in a way that they weren't of previously. So lo lots of things I think are emerging yeah. and will emerge over the next few months that we probably yeah. weren't aware of previously. And that might change our relationship with, with some of the tools um, mm. and the way that, you know, we actually pick up on them uh, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Good point, Rob. Tundi? Uh, yes, thank you, Jim. Uh, yeah, and thanks for that, Rob. I, I suppose the issue with um, ethics is always going to be there. Um, and, and I think it's uh, worth, you know, continuing that sort of dialogue. Uh, what I would say uh, is that we need to think about um, this disruptive technology, because I know that, you know, we've been talking about some of the challenges that um, chat GPT currently has. And I know it's a matter of time before it sort of um, overcomes those challenges. So what I would say basically is as academics or as um, technology providers or as educators, we need to start thinking that this is a technology that has come to stay. Uh, and we need to think about it as a, a technology that would continue to improve. The question is, how do we sort of, um, you know, with it? How do we ensure that we are able to sort of utilize it, for example, in that sort of um, adaptive learning um, um, uh, system because I come from this sort of inclusivity and um, space and I think that this tool is one of the tools that would help address some of these inclusivity issues but we need to start thinking about how we can use it directly to address some of those issues um, is mm. what I would say and to answer the question I can't remember the name of the person who asked, who asked it um, with regards to you know you know forcing um, students to sort of um, recall knowledge um, so to speak uh, of course I, I agree with you that you know I, I don't think that that is right I think it should be more about um, application and that's another perspective that we can adapt to um, chat GPT so rather than just you know um, coming up with content it should be more around you know how do students apply this knowledge that they've sort of curated or you know um, gotten from chat GPT in a different you know um, a different setting altogether and that that's all I'm just going to say for now Thank you. Thank you. Rona, I think you've got your hand up. I was going to just say a word about developing students' digital literacies before we finish. Mm. This is in response to yeah. a question from Geraldine right at the beginning, and where she said, um, it's a bit of a worry that students might assume it produces correct answers. These AI tools mm. produce correct answers. Um, and I suppose my response to that would be is that any different from students reading web pages and assuming the information presented on the web pages are correct and think of all that work we've done largely with the support of librarians about teaching students how to assess the credibility of their sources digital or otherwise and all that work we did getting students to write wikipedia pages to understand how wikipedia works before they trust it as a source i think it's exactly the same issue with the AI tools as it is that we've already encountered with some of these other things. So we need to develop the digital literacies. And for the AI um, bots, that means I think as Phil has just been saying recently in the in the chat with this kind of weird um, data sources, 
it means we need to understand the data sources that the AI tools need. And our professor, one of our professors of AI here at Oxford was telling us last week that some of these AI bots have run out of the internet as a data source and are going to social media in order uh -huh. to, to, to gather the uh -huh. vast amount of data that they need to run their algorithm. So it's really important that we develop students' digital literacies in this case to understand mm -hmm. what data the bot is drawing on in order to create its answers. Wow. Uh, Sue, I wonder if I could move over to you to uh, summarize perhaps a little bit because we're running, uh, I think we've got about three minutes left. Okay, I'll be back. Uh, leave, us, leave us with some encouraging words. Uh, I'm, I'm going to actually because I'm really pleased to see there's lots of comments around you know talking to the students including those in in you know how AI is included I do see AI as an opportunity uh, rather than a threat but just about looking at all sides but I think one of the important things and um, we captured it in the recent uh, blog post which somebody posted earlier is that in a lot of these cases, we did a lot of research around guidance and whether new guidance and everything is needed. And we looked at a lot of policies and things that already exist. And you know, one of our main conclusions was that there's actually no need for extra guidance to come down focusing on the tech because the existing academic policies already cover most of these areas. You know, so if you just use what you already have and think of that, then then a lot of the time it's covered. And this is just another tech. Brilliant. Thank you, Sue. So we, we can, uh, I think um, what I've gathered from this is uh, this don't panic, don't move too fast. Let's take a breather and reflect and use our students to help us understand what's happening before we make massive changes. Um, uh, that kind of we're we're down to the last couple of minutes so if you do have a question which we haven't addressed and you'd like uh, the panel to um, have a look at it we do have a link that um, I just shared and I think Emma just reshared you can put in your comment in there uh, I think we can save this chat as well so we might go through that and see what we can uh, find. We will write this up as a blog article on the alt site, so you might see some of your questions uh, addressed there as well. I want to thank ever so much the uh, panel for taking the time um, to think about this, dwell on it and share that and thanks ever so much as well for everybody coming along and having hopefully a really rewarding chat on the chat space. Um, so uh, we will be having more events soon. Keep an eye out for Ellie Sig, and um, and we hope to see you all again soon. So uh, thank you very much. I think uh, I'm getting a, a lot of pings in my ear at the moment. I don't know whether everybody else is, but I think that's a 